So we just got to see uh, three-year-old Jonathan playing to Mozart. And I think it's a nice example or a nice way to start the evening because it's an example of creativity that we can all appreciate. We can see that it has certain requirements like uh, curio curiosity, exploration, imagination, that ability for Jonathan to step onto this cushion and wave his, his wand. And of course, it required playfulness. Welcome to Creativity, the playground of the brain. My name's Sam Myler. I'm a PhD student here at the Champalimau Neuroscience Program. And tonight, as Leonor, Dr. Leonor was saying, we're going to have artist Vic Munish and neuroscientist Rui Costa speak about creativity. So when I was in university, I was studying to become a biologist, and I came across a man who really inspired me called Michael Motion. He wasn't, in fact, a biologist. He was a juggler. And he spent hours and hours juggling every day. And one day the thought came to him, can I juggle without throwing the ball? And he created a new type of juggling, one where the ball never left his hand. Thank you. So he took an old idea, which was juggling, and by giving it a new form, he turned it into something entirely different. Something that he thought was new and valuable from his perspective, and also from mine when I was in university. New and valuable, which is exactly the definition that Henry Miller uses to describe creativity. Henry Miller says that creativity is the occurrence of a composition which is both new and valuable. Of course, a scientist might take a slightly different approach. H.H. H. Fox describes creativity as any thinking process in which original patterns are formed. And so depending on whether you're a psychologist, a mathematician, a musician, or a singer, you might have a different criteria for defining what creativity is. What we do know, though, is that creativity is a function of processes in our brain. And not only that, it's not just limited to artists like uh, Picasso or Van Gogh or writers like Shakespeare or Camus, but it's used every day in a variety of contexts by scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, politicians. And, and so one of the questions as neuroscientists we can ask is, is creativity unique to the human brain? So for example, these two photos were sold for 25,000 US dollars in an art exhibition in the US. And they were painted by an artist named Congo. Now the, the only thing that was unusual about this was that Congo was in fact a chimpanzee. Novel, valuable, required original patterns of thinking. At first glance, these two photos or these two paintings seem like they fit with this definition of creativity. But to know that for sure, we'd have to ask the question, what was happening in Congo's brain when he drew these pictures? Was he playing with colors? Was he trying to capture some chimpanzee landscape that only he saw? Or was he, had he learned a motor task? So was he just picking up a brush and dragging it along a piece of paper? And every time he did this, someone would give him a banana, so he just kept doing it. Great. Come. So we see, especially in nature in the laboratory, we, see, we begin to see examples of creativity in animals, especially in the realm of problem solving, where animals have to generate new solutions to old problems. And for example, in this video, we see a crow who has learned that she can press a lever down with her beak and she can access food. In the second example though, there's a cylinder tube that's been placed that doesn't allow her to access the lever as before. She has to find a new solution. And here we can see her trying. Pretty cool, right? It's like one of those films, you keep seeing the ending even though you know what's going to happen. So, so one of the things here that's important to note is that she wasn't taught this. 
she discovered it. And so, so one of the questions we can ask is, did this solution require creativity? And so, as neuroscientists, we're interested in what happens in the brain when we're creative. We're interested in asking questions like, what are the mechanisms that allow us to be creative? We can even ask, is there a specific place for creativity in the brain? For example, in this experiment, normal human volunteers were presented with a problem that required a creative solution. And by using increases in blood flow as a proxy for neural activity, investigators were trying to capture specific places. So in this image, we see these specific places in the brain that were trying to be used when they had that creative flash of insight, that moment of inspiration, that thing that is often called the aha moment. Of course, immortalized by Archimedes running naked down the street, screaming, Eureka, Eureka. So I'm not going to take my clothes off for you tonight, thankfully for you guys. But we are interested in looking at creativity as a process, something that isn't just an aha moment, but something that requires hard work, requires making mistakes, requires intuition, and on some level requires returning to the playground. And I think the next video kind of captures this idea that for adults, creativity can be fun and engaging just the way it is. Just like three-year-old Jonathan. I'd like to finish this short introduction with a poem by uh, Fernand Pessoa, who I think captured something really nice about creativity, about this theme when he said the following. Há um tempo em que é preciso abandonar as roupas usadas, que já têm a forma do nosso corpo, e esquecer os nossos caminhos que nos levam sempre aos mesmos lugares. É o tempo da travessia, e se não ousaremos fazê-la, teremos ficado para sempre à margem de nós mesmos. And so for me, it feels like this creativity, this idea of creativity is, is knowing when to abandon these old clothes that no longer fit us. Thank you very much.